Four Weird Tales by Algernon Blackwood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Four Weird Tales by Algernon Blackwood. Sand. Chapter Two. He slipped through Cairo with the same relief that he left the Riviera, resenting its social vulgarity so close to the imperial aristocracy of the desert. He settled down into the peace of soft and silent little Heluan. The hotel in which he had a room on the top floor had been formerly a Kedival palace. It had the air of a palace still. He felt himself in a country house with lofty ceilings, cool and airy corridors, spacious halls. Soft-footed Arabs attended to his wants. White walls let in light and air without a sign of heat. There was a feeling of a large spread tent pitched on the very sand, and the wind that stirred the oleanders in the shady garden also crept in to rustle the palm-leaves of his favourite corner seat. Through the large windows, where once the Kedive held high court, the sunshine blazed upon vistaed leagues of desert, and from his bedroom windows he watched the sun dip into gold and crimson behind the swelling Libyan sands. This side of the pyramids he saw the Nile meander among palm-groves and tilled fields, Across his balcony railings the Egyptian stars trooped down beside his very bed, shaping old constellations for his dreams, while to the south he looked out upon the vast, untamable body of the sands that carpeted the world for thousands of miles toward Upper Egypt, Nubia, and the dread Sahara itself. He wondered again why people thought it necessary to go so far afield to know the desert. Here, within half an hour of Cairo, it lay breathing solemnly at his very doors. For little Heloan, caught thus between the shoulders of the Libyan and Arabian deserts, is utterly sand-haunted. The desert lies all around it like a sea. Henriot felt he never could escape from it, as he moved about the island whose coasts are washed with sand. Down each broad and shining street the two end-houses framed a vista of its dim immensity— glimpses of shimmering blue or flame-touched purple. There were stretches of deep sea-green as well, far off upon its bosom. The streets were open channels of approach, and the eye ran down them as along the tube of telescope laid to catch the incredible distance out of space. Through them the desert reached in with long, thin feelers toward the village. Its being flooded into Heluan and over it, past walls and houses, churches and hotels, the sea of desert pressed in silently with its myriad soft feet of sand. It poured in everywhere, through crack and slit and cranny. These were reminders of possession and ownership, and every passing wind that lifted eddies of dust at the street corners were messages from the quiet, powerful thing that permitted Heloan to lie and dream so peacefully in the sunshine." Mere artificial oasis, its existence was temporary, held on lease just for ninety-nine centuries or so. This sea idea became insistent, for in certain lights, and especially in the brief bewildering dusk, the desert rose, swaying towards the small white houses. The waves of it ran for fifty miles without a break. It was too deep for foam or surface agitation, yet it knew the swell of tides— and underneath flowed resolute currents linking distance to the centre. These many deserts were really one. A storm, just retreated, had tossed Heloan upon the shore and left it there to dry. But any morning he would wake to find that it had been carried off again into the depths. Some fragment at least would disappear. The grim Moktam hills were rollers that ever threatened to topple down and submerge the sandy bar that men called Heloan. Being soundless and devoid of perfume, the desert's message reached him through two senses only, sight and touch, chiefly, of course, the former. Its invasion was concentrated through the eyes, and vision thus uncorrected went what pace it pleased. The desert played with him, sand stole into his being through the eyes. And so obsessing was this majesty of its close presence— that Henriot sometimes wondered how people dared their little social activities within its very sight and hearing, how they played golf and tennis upon reclaimed edges of its face, picnicked so blithely hard upon its frontiers, and danced at night while this stern, unfathomable thing lay breathing just beyond the trumpery walls that kept it out. 
the challenge of their shallow admiration seemed presumptuous, almost provocative. Their pursuit of pleasure suggested insolent indifference. They ran foolhardy hazards, he felt, for there was no worship in their vulgar hearts. With a mental shudder, sometimes he watched the cheap tourist horde go laughing, chattering past within view of its ancient half-closed eyes. It was like defying deity. For to his stirred imagination the sublimity of the desert dwarfed humanity. These people had been wiser to choose another place for the flaunting of their tawdry insignificance. Any minute this wilderness, huddled in grey annihilation, might awake and notice them. In his own hotel were several smart, so-called society people, who emphasised the protest in him to the point of definite contempt. Overdressed, the latest worldly novel under their arms, they strutted the narrow pavements of their tiny world, immensely pleased with themselves. Their vacuous minds expressed themselves in the slaying of their exclusive circle, value being the element excluded. The pettiness of their outlook hardly distressed him. He was too familiar with it at home. But their essential vulgarity, their innate ugliness, seemed more than usually offensive in the grandeur of its present setting. Into the mighty sands they took the latest London scandal, gabbling it over even among the tombs and temples. And it was to laugh, the pains they sent wondering, whom they might condescend to know, never dreaming that they themselves were not worth knowing. Against the backdrop of the noble desert their titles seemed the cap and bells of clowns. And Henriot, knowing some of them personally, could not always escape their insipid company— yet he was the gainer. They little guessed how their commonness heightened contrast set mercilessly thus beside the strange, eternal beauty of the sand. Occasionally the protest in his soul betrayed itself in words, which of course they did not understand. He is so clever, isn't he? And then, having relieved his feelings, he would comfort himself characteristically. The desert has not noticed them. The sand is not aware of their existence. How should the sea take note of rubbish that lies above its tide-line? For Henriot drew near to its great shifting altars in an attitude of worship. The wilderness made him kneel in heart. Its shining reaches led to the oldest temple in the world, and every journey that he made was like a sacrament. For him the desert was a consecrated place. It was sacred. And his tactful hosts, knowing his peculiarities, left their house open to him when he cared to come. They lived upon the northern edge of the oasis, and he was as free as though he were absolutely alone. He blessed them. He rejoiced that he had come. Little Helouan accepted him. The desert knew that he was there. From his corner of the big dining-room he could see the other guests, but his roving eye always returned to the figure of a solitary man who sat at an adjoining table and whose personality stirred his interest. While affecting to look elsewhere he studied him as closely as might be. There was something about the stranger that touched his curiosity, a certain air of expectation that he wore, but it was more than that. It was anticipation, apprehension in it somewhere. The man was nervous, uneasy. His restless way of suddenly looking about him proved it. Henriot tried everyone else in the room as well, but though his thought settled on others too, he always came back to the figure of this solitary being opposite, who ate his dinner as if afraid of being seen, and glanced up sometimes as if fearful of being watched. Henriot's curiosity, before he knew it, became suspicion. There was mystery here. The table he noticed was laid for two. Is he an actor? A priest of some strange religion? An inquirer agent? Or just a crank? Was the thought that first occurred to him, and the question suggested itself without amusement. The impression of subterfuge and caution he conveyed left his observer unsatisfied. The face was clean-shaven, dark and strong. Thick hair, straight yet bushy, was slightly unkempt. It was streaked with grey, and an unexpected mobility when he smiled ran over the features that he seemed to hold rigid by deliberate effort. The man was cut to no quite common measure. Henriot jumped to an intuitive conclusion. "'He's not here for pleasure or merely sightseeing.' Something serious has brought him out to Egypt. For the face combined two ill-assorted qualities, an obstinate tenacity that might even mean brutality, and was certainly repulsive, yet with it an undecipherable dreaminess betrayed by lines of the mouth, 
but above all in the very light blue eyes, so rarely raised. Those eyes, he felt, had looked upon unusual things. Dreaminess was not an adequate description. Searching conveyed it better. The true source of the queer impression remained elusive, and hence, perhaps, the incongruous marriage in the face, mobility laid upon a matter-of-fact foundation beneath. The face showed conflict. And Henriot, watching him, felt decidedly intrigued. I'd like to know that man, and all about him. His name, he learned later, was Richard Vance, from Birmingham, a businessman. But it was not the Birmingham he wished to know, it was the other cause of the elusive dreamy searching. Though facing one another at so short a distance, their eyes, however, did not meet, and this, Henriot well knew, was a sure sign that he himself was also under observation. Richard Vance, from Birmingham, was equally taking careful note of Felix Henriot, from London. Thus he could wait his time. They would come together later. An opportunity would certainly present itself. The first links in a curious chain had already caught. Soon the chain would tighten, pull as though by chance, and bring their lives into one and the same circle. Wondering in particular for what kind of companion the second cover was laid, Henriot felt certain that their eventual coming together was inevitable. He possessed this kind of divination from first impressions, and not uncommonly it proved correct. Following instinct, therefore, he took no steps toward acquaintance, and for several days, owing to the fact that he dined frequently with his hosts, he saw nothing more of Richard Vance, the businessman from Birmingham. Then one night, coming home late from his friend's house, he had passed along the great corridor and was actually a step or so into his bedroom when a drawling voice sounded close behind him. It was an unpleasant sound. It was very near him, too. I beg your pardon, but have you, by any chance, such a thing as a compass you could lend me? The voice was so close that he started. Vance stood within touching distance of his body. He had stolen up like a ghostly Arab, must have followed him, too, some little distance, for further down the passage the light of an open door, he had passed it on his way, showed where he came from. Eh, hey, I beg your pardon? A compass, did you say? He felt disconcerted for a moment. How short the man was, now that he saw him standing, broad and powerful, too. Henriot looked down upon his thick head of hair. The personality and voice repelled him. Possibly his face, caught unawares, betrayed this. "'Forgive my startling you,' said the other apologetically, while the softer expression danced in for a moment and disorganised the rigid set of the face. "'The soft carpet, you know. I'm afraid you didn't hear my tread. I wondered,' he smiled again slightly at the nature of the request, "'if, by any chance, you had a pocket compass you could lend me.' "'Ah, a compass. Yes. Please don't apologise. I believe I have one, if you'll wait a moment. Come in, won't you? I'll have a look.' The other thanked him, but waited in the passage. Henriot, it so happened, had a compass, and produced it after a moment's search. "'I am greatly indebted to you. If I may return it in the morning, you will forgive my disturbing you at such an hour. My own is broken, and I wanted uh, to find the true north.' Henriot stammered some reply, and the man was gone. It was all over in a minute. He locked his door and sat down in his chair to think. The little incident had upset him, though for the life of him he could not imagine why. It ought by rights to have been almost ludicrous, yet instead it was the exact reverse, half-threatening. Why should not a man want a compass? But again, why should he? And at midnight? The voice, the eyes, the near presence. What did they bring that set his nerves thus asking unusual questions? This strange impression that something grave was happening, something unearthly— how was it born exactly? The man's proximity came like a shock. It had made him start. He brought, thus the idea came unbidden to his mind, something with him that galvanized him quite absurdly, as fear does, or delight, or great wonder. There was a music in his voice, too, a certain, well, he could only call it a lilt, that reminded him of plain song, intoning, chanting. Drawling was not the word at all. He tried to dismiss it as imagination, but it would not be dismissed. The disturbance in himself was caused by something not imaginary, but real. And then, for the first time, he discovered that the man had brought a faint, elusive suggestion of perfume with him, 
an aromatic odour that made him think of priests and churches. The ghost of it still lingered in the air. Ah, here, then, was the origin of the notion that his voice had chanted. It was surely the suggestion of incense. But incense, intoning, a compass to find the true north, at midnight in a desert hotel? A touch of uneasiness ran through the curiosity and excitement that he felt. And he undressed for bed. Confound my old imagination, he thought. What tricks it plays me! It'll keep me awake. But the questions, once started in his mind, continued. He must find explanation of one kind or another before he could lie down and sleep, and he found it at length in the stars. The man was an astronomer of sorts, possibly an astrologer into the bargain. Why not? The stars were wonderful above Helouan. Was there not an observatory on the Mokhtam Hills, too, where tourists could use the telescope on privileged days? He had it at last. He even stole out on his balcony to see if the stranger, perhaps, was looking through some wonderful apparatus at the heavens. Their rooms were on the same side, but the shuttered windows revealed no stooping figure with eyes glued to a telescope. The stars blinked in their many thousands down upon the silent desert. The night held neither sound nor movement. There was a cool breeze blowing across the Nile from the Libyan sands. It nipped, and he stepped back quickly into the room again. Drawing the mosquito curtains carefully about the bed, he put the light out and turned over to sleep. And sleep came quickly, contrary to his expectations, though it was a light and surface sleep. That last glimpse of the darkened desert lying beneath the Egyptian stars had touched him with some hand of awful power that ousted the first lesser excitement. It calmed and soothed him in one sense, yet in another, a sense he could not understand, it caught him in a net of deep, deep feelings whose mesh, while infinitely delicate, was utterly stupendous. His nerves, this deeper emotion left alone, it reached instead to something infinite in him that mere nerves could neither deal with nor interpret. The soul awoke and whispered in him while his body slept. And the little foolish dreams that ran to and fro across this veil of surface sleep brought oddly tangled pictures of things quite tiny, and at the same time of others that were mighty beyond words. With these two counters nightmare played, they interwove. There was the figure of this dark-faced man with the compass measuring the sky to find the true north, and there were hints of giant presences that hovered just outside some curious outline that he traced upon the ground, copied in some nightmare fashion from the heavens. The excitement caused by his visitor's singular request mingled with the profounder sensations his final look at the stars and desert stirred. The two were somehow interrelated. Some hours later, before this surface sleep passed into genuine slumber, Henry awoke with an appalling feeling that the desert had come creeping into his room and now stared down upon him where he lay in bed. The wind was crying audibly about the walls outside— a faint sharp tapping came against the window panes. He sprang instantly out of bed, not yet awake enough to feel actual alarm, yet with the nightmare touch still close enough to cause a sort of feverish loose bewilderment. He switched the lights on. A moment later he knew the meaning of that curious tapping, for the rising wind was flinging tiny specks of sand against the glass. The idea that they had summoned him belonged, of course, to dream. He opened the window and stepped out onto the balcony. The stone was very cold under his bare feet. There was a wash of wind all over him. He saw the sheet of glimmering pale desert near and far, and something stung his skin below the eyes. The sand, he whispered. Again the sand, always the sand. Waking or sleeping, the sand is everywhere. Nothing but sand, sand, sand. He rubbed his eyes. It was like talking in his sleep— talking to someone who had questioned him just before he woke. But was he really properly awake? It seemed next day that he had dreamed it. Something enormous with rustling skirts of sand had just retreated far into the desert. Sand went with it, flowing, trailing, smothering the world. The wind died down. And Henriot went back to sleep, caught instantly away into unconsciousness, covered, blinded, swept over by this spreading thing of reddish-brown, with the great grey face, whose being was colossal yet quite tiny, and whose fingers, wings, and eyes were countless as the stars. But all night long it watched and waited, 
rising to peer above the little balcony and sometimes entering the room and piling up beside his very pillow he dreamed of sand end of chapter two